Connect with yourself and discover the inner peace awaiting you in our online yoga course with Sadhguru. Join us in the online yoga course with Sadhguru. The link is in the description. This happened in Los Angeles. A cardiac surgeon drove his... Uh, he was little fascinated with his Ford Mustang. That was his car and he was a little excited about it and uh, one day it started coughing a little bit. So he took it to the local mechanic and said, some problem, please fix it. He said, yeah, doc, come tomorrow morning, it'll be ready. The doctor, before going to work tomorrow morning, he went there, but it was not ready. So he said, okay, come in the evening, it'll be ready. He came in the evening, it was not ready. He said, what's the matter? You said morning, I came. He said evening, I came, what is the issue? And the mechanic was in that kind of mood, he said, see, you're a heart surgeon, you also fix engines, I also fix engines, how come you're paid ten times more than me? So the doctor looked, him, looked at him and said, try to fix the engine when it's running, let me see. So human life and human body needs to be fixed when it's running, otherwise it's meaningless. All right, you're going to postmortem. <laughs> What's the point of that? We need to fix this body when it's running. If you want to fix this body when it's running, you must understand, because we're talking about something related to digestive process. These are the stages of this ingestion, putting something inside. Digestion, assimilation, excretion. These are four dimensions of food and the whole process. Ingestion, digestion, assimilation, excretion. Ingestion is happening in today's world just about any time, wherever they are sitting, standing, any time of the day or night, people just eat because there's so much food. It was not like this ever in the history of humanity. But unfortunately, fortunately there is a lot of food, unfortunately, people don't know when to eat, when not to eat. As there are cycles in time, see we know time only by cycles. If the planet spins one like this, one spin, we say it's a day, otherwise you wouldn't know. If the moon goes around, we say one month. If we go around the sun, then we say one year. So our idea of time is essentially cycles. Our birth and death is also a question of cycles. Only because our mother's bodies were in sync with the cycles of the moon, we are even born, otherwise we wouldn't be born. So our whole physical existence is cyclical. The entire spiritual process, we could go into that if you wish, essentially is significant because it's not cyclical. Because cyclical means you're going in circles. If I say you're going in circles, what does it imply? You're in a loop. You're not getting anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually if I leave you in desert where here there are some mountains, if there are no features, it's just sand, then people end up going in circles. That means you're not getting anywhere, that means you're lost. So the moment you are completely identified with your body and your psychological structure, you will start going in cycles. So in India, it's in the yogic uh, culture, it's very, very clear, this is called a samsara, that means cyclical life. So cyclical life, as good a merry-go-round it may be, you know, if you arrange it well, it's a good merry-go-round, but you're not getting anywhere. Children can enjoy a merry-go-round. If all the adults are sitting in the merry-go-round and going round and round thinking they're traveling, oh, very tragic, isn't it? So that's what happens. So the body is a cycle. These cycles are very connected with the planetary cycles, with the moon cycle, with the sun cycle, everything. Lunar cycles, solar cycles and the earth cycles are very important for the body. If one has the necessary awareness, they could observe on which day your body doesn't need food. Every other creature knows this. Unfortunately, human beings have forgotten because their 
thought process or their silly mind has superimposed every other sense they have in their system. If you observe your system, you will see on a particular day, you don't feel like eating. That day you should not eat. But no, you're at your friend's house, there is a party, you stuff yourself, even if your body says no, you stuff yourself. You see all the animals, even if you have a dog at home, on a certain day he refuses to eat both dogs and cats. Have you noticed this? He will go and eat some blades of grass if it's available and puke and cleanses himself because he's conscious that ingestion is continuously happening, but digestion and excretion is not as efficient as ingestion. Ingestion is happening compulsively, but other parts need to work. Other dimensions of digestive process needs to work. When we say digestion, digestion happens in the whole alimentary canal, not just in the stomach. And assimilation also happens across the entire alimentary canal. Now, excretion doesn't happen only through the alimentary canal, excretion needs to happen on the cellular level also. Impurities gather over a period of time and you become dense, both in body and head <laughs> If you don't cleanse yourself, then uh, it'll pile up over a period of time. We call this karma, because when it piles up, it determines the way you think, feel, understand and experience life. People may not realize this, but they will think, this is how I am, this is my nature, this is not your nature, this is the way you messed yourself, all right? So this cleansing process, one important thing is to give a break for ingestion. Because other systems are largely involuntary, you can stimulate them, but they're involuntary, they're functioning. Ingestion is a voluntary process, though unfortunately for most people it's become compulsive. It should be a voluntary process, that is, I eat when I want to eat. When I decide I want to eat, I will eat. My hand doesn't decide when to eat, if there's anything, Anything, you know, people are doing this all the time. <laughs> I relate. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we leave a bunch of good chocolates around you, your hand will eat, not you. <laughs> so ingestion should be a conscious process. To bring this consciousness, there are many methods. One is fasting. Simply denying yourself food and water could cause damage to the system. You must support it with the necessary practices. If you have the necessary practices, the need for food will come down. See, our energies are not coming only from the food that we eat. The sunlight, the air, the water... Actually, if you... in the yogic sciences, we say, if you really keep your system well, sixty to seventy percent of your energy should come from these three factors – sunlight, air, water. Another forty percent should come from the food that you eat. So naturally, food, amount of volume of food, food that you eat will compress. I must tell you about myself. When I was young, I'm a big eater. I never became big because my activity was immense. But today what I eat is actually one-tenth or less than one-tenth of what I used to eat at that time. From the age of nineteen till now, I'm still the same weight. Same weight, what I was at nineteen. Only thing is, at that time, all the weight was on my shoulders. Now, because of this gravity continuously working on me, kind of pulled it down a little bit. <laughs> but I kept myself up <laughs> So, fasting as a process must be done with necessary understanding. If people don't have that awareness, in India we fixed the eleventh day of the moon cycle, you must fast. If you're not able to fast, you go on something very light, it's called palhar. That means you go on fruit diet. Because fruit is a substance which is over ninety percent water, and you must eat water, not drink water. This is the yogic science. As far as possible, you eat water. You always be conscious about the food that you're eating, what is the water content. Like a South Indian meal, if you eat, a cooked meal I'm talking about, if you eat, very easily sixty, seventy percent water. In fact, more. In some of the foods, it's much more. But now the food that you're eating here, you're eating bread, which was baked a month ago probably, is that minimum? Even in so-called uh, organic shops, 
it's at least a month or at least a week. Nobody is going and getting fresh bread and come and anyway, the way the bread is baked, it doesn't have water in it, very, very little water. So, of course, you're uh, compensating that with uh, a bucket of Coca-Cola or something like that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I said a bucket, A no? bucket is a good amount of Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> is this big? Yeah. <laughs> but that doesn't work like that. You, if you drink any liquid along with your food, the acids that are necessary for digestive process will get diluted. Your whole digestive process gets inefficient. Because food, when it goes in, if it contains water, it's assists. But if you put any liquid on top of it, you will see the food will remain in the stomach bag for too long. We are very concerned about this always in the yogic uh, culture and life that we don't want food to remain in our stomach bag for more than two and a half hours maximum. In two and a half hours time, it doesn't matter what I've eaten, how much I've eaten, it must go into other parts. If it remains there, it makes you dull. It makes you lose your sense of perception. Your pers the level of perception, the keenness of perception is lost, which you notice if you eat food without coke or coffee or tea or anything, you feel dull. It kind of pulls you down. Whole lot of people have developed a culture around it, after lunch they have to sleep. It's like you went to the gas station, you fueled up, then you can't start the engine <laughs> because there is a gas in the tank. So that, that's what it means. So to ensure that digestive system is in full process, because for most of the chronic ailments that people are suffering today in the world, the headquarters is in the stomach. Yes. But a lot of people, it's shifting to their head, but largely headquarters is in the stomach, the way... what they eat and the way they eat. So in this way they eat, one simple thing to bring discipline is, maybe one or two days in a month, you go on much lighter foods which are very simple and easy in the body. If you can just thrive on water or just a little bit of lemon and water or little late, lightly honey-laced water, it will help. But if it's not possible for you, maybe a fruit or something, which, which is very, very light on the system. The idea is to give digestive process and assimilation process a break so that rest of the body begins to excrete. On the cellular level, it must throw out all the impurities. So if enlightenment happens, how do we know it has happened? Suppose we are hallucinating to be enlightened. <laughs> if such a thing happens, it will be clearer than daylight. It's not something that you can miss. It is not that kind of an event that you could miss it. You will not miss it. But when I say this, there is a problem attached to this because these days it is going on in many places. For a certain fee, within a weekend's time you can get enlightened. You'll be declared enlightened by somebody. Really? <laughs> it's happening everywhere. If you just pay a certain amount of money, one weekend you can get enlightened. I remember in the sixties, in the nineteen sixties, in California, people set up certain businesses, enlightenment services. The advertisement I remember very well, if you go to India, it will take twelve years of hardship. Fifty dollars, thirty minutes, you can get enlightened. They were just using psychedelic machines. You put up certain visuals and certain sounds, it'll just blow your mind apart. Because of the sounds and the visuals, when you come out, you come in a daze. You feel like you have really gotten somewhere. This used to be the advertisement. Fifty dollars, thirty minutes, if you go to India, twelve years of hardship. Here, it's California, quick, new technology. These nineteen-sixty machines, 
this old technology has now infiltrated into India. Some people have installed these machines and they are claiming within a weekend they can enlighten you. You cannot hallucinate about it. If you are sincere, you would know that it is not so. But if it's a part of the race that you want to get enlightened before somebody, of course you can declare I am enlightened. It is just that these kind of deceptions are not new on the planet. They have been happening for a long time, but now modern technology has come to aid them better, to give them an expanded sense of many things. Much experimentation was done during the sixties and seventies about these things. One is with the psychedelic machines, another is with psychedelic drugs. You take an LSD and people claim they are enlightened because they had an expanded sense just for a while and then they came back. If they overdid it, then they lost everything, they cracked up in so many ways or even died. Many, many people mentally cracked up because of excessive use of psychedelic drugs. But for those few moments, they really felt enlightened or at least they thought so. This is not something that you do. This is not something that you can do. It is just that if you cultivate the system, your body, mind, emotion and energy to its peak possibility, then an absolutely wonderful flower blossoms within you. Not something that you did, you just waited with the right kind of conditions and it happened. There's a very beautiful story in the yogic lore. On a certain day, four men were walking in the forest. These four men were walking in the forest. One is a jnana yogi, another is a bhakti yogi, another is a karma yogi and the last one is a kriya yogi. These four people can never stay together. They cannot be together because a jnana yogi means yoga of intelligence. He is a man of intellect, great intellect. He has complete disdain for everybody. He thinks everybody is a fool. Especially these bhakti yogis who are doing Ram Ram or whatever, in his mind they look like utter idiots. He can't stand them. Isn't it? Please them. <laughs> Could that man stand bhakti yogis? No, he wouldn't stand. <laughs> he just can't tolerate them. <laughs> bhakti yogis, people of devotion, they have pity for everybody because when God Himself is here, you are doing all this mental circus and physical circus, it's just stupid, isn't it? Just hold God's hand and walk into heaven. So bhakti yogis have pity for everybody, for all the foolishness that they are doing. Karma yogis think, all these other people are just lazy people because if you want something to happen, you have to do it. Because they are lazy and unwilling to do what they need to do, they have invented all these other yogas. <laughs> because in the world if anything has to happen, you must do it, right? Action. These are yoga of action, karma. Kriya yogis have utter disdain for everybody because after all the whole existence is energy. Unless you transform the energy, how will anything change? Where is the possibility? So, these four people can never be together, but today they were walking together. 
Suddenly a thunderstorm broke loose, a rainstorm, rain started lashing from every side. They started running looking for shelter. The Bhakti Yogi said, there is an ancient temple in this direction, let's go there for shelter. He always knows the geography of temples, he won't miss a single temple. So they all trusted him and ran in the direction. Then they found an ancient temple where the walls had collapsed long ago. Just a few columns and a roof was there and in the center there was a deity, God's image. They ran into this place, not because they were seeking God, not in any kind of love for God, just to escape the rain. They ran in. And then they stood there for a while, then they found the rain started lash lashing from every direction. Wherever they stood or sat, the rain was getting at them. So the only place where they could sit was around the deity. So all four of them just hugged the deity and sat. Not because they have fallen in love with God, simply to escape the rain. Suddenly, God appeared. In all their four minds, the same question, why now? We did so much yoga, we did so much puja, worship and so many things, you didn't come then. Now when we are just escaping the rain, why now? And God said, at last you four idiots got together. <laughs> Without these four things getting together within you, your head, your heart, your hands and your energy, unless it all falls into place, unless all of it reaches its peak, it will not happen. And if it happens, is there any chance that I may not notice it? There is no such thing. Even if you are blind, you know the sun has come up, isn't it? Yes? yes. Even if you are blind, you still know the sun has come up because nobody can miss it. It is not a small event that anybody can miss. You may not know whether you are born or not born, but if you get enlightened, you will know. <laughs> it's much bigger than that. <laughs> Birth will happen many times, this will happen only once. Shankar and Pillai had Why? You're laughing at somebody's ailment, this is not good. <laughs> Shankaran Pillai had chronic tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. So he went to the doctor. Been festering for a long time but uh, it became too much of a problem so he went. The doctor took an x-ray and looked big, holes in the lungs. He said, uh, you need to get admitted into the hospital right away. And uh, it takes a minor surgery and you have to stay in the hospital minimum six months and it will cost you fifty thousand dollars. Chankaran Pillai said, <coughs> no, no way. <laughs> Fifty thousand for sure I don't have. Six months, no way. I can give you hundred dollars, what can you do? Now, the doctor looked at him, looked at the x-ray, looked at him, looked at the x-ray. He said, well, for hundred dollars, I could touch up the x-ray for you. <laughs> it is possible that 
you could have caused physical damage to your system, an ailment, because of your patterns of thinking, very much possible. Because you are a psychosoma, whatever happens in the mind invariably happens in the body. But once the damage is manifested in the body, physically, trying to think it away could be just wishful thinking. I'm not saying it's not at all possible, but uh, after all you have only one life, you don't want to take such a risk. Yes, you would like to assist it with your thought process also. But uh, no, I will just sit down and think it away. You may think yourself away, you know. <laughs> So, don't try such things. Disease or no disease, ailment or no ailment, you have no business to make a mess out of your mind. You have no business to torture this being. Whether you get ailment or you don't get an ailment is the next thing. But you have simply no business to torture this being. Because this is, in a way, it's a helpless being. See, if I run after you with a hot iron right now, you will try to escape. You'll call for help. You can do all those things. But suppose you take a hot iron and start putting it to this one, where will this one run? Even if you are a child, you can still have some defense, yes? Even as a five, six-year-old kid has some defense, isn't it? But this one, no defense. Whatever nonsense you do to this one, it has to just go through it, no escape. So this is like torturing a fetus trapped inside, now you start poking it. This is just like that, yes? The cruelest form of torture, the cruelest thing that you can do is self-torture because a totally helpless being, everybody else, however helpless they are, they have some defense, isn't it? Yes? The weakest person can stab you when, when you are fast asleep. Yes or no? It's happened, isn't it? Somebody is weak, you went on poking them, one day when you are sleeping they came and poked you. They can do something. Even the very weak person, even a child can do something to you. But this one, totally helpless. So you have no business to torture this one, whether you have got an ailment or you haven't got an ailment. If you have gotten an ailment already, you have already taken it that far that uh, you cause damage to the system, it is better that it is assisted in all ways possible. Yes, definitely you must stop your nonsense. but. Uh, if the system needs medicine, surgery, this one, that one, whatever is needed, it has to be done trying to just think it away. Because you brought it through your mind, do not think that you can take it away through your mind. Possible, I'm not saying no at all. I cannot say it's hundred percent no, it is possible. But uh, you don't try such things because you may think yourself away. <laughs> Once it crosses a certain point, uh, then nobody can help you, isn't it? Yes? Even your doctors give up at some point or no? Or they… The only people who don't give up on you is insurance. <laughs> Everybody else gives up on you at some point. The only people who don't want to give up on you is insurance because you know. <laughs> so, keeping your mind life friendly is definitely your business. Your mind should be friendly to this life, isn't it so? Should work for this life. After all, your mind is your employee. Yes or no? Why have you made him your enemy? If you do not know how to handle the people who work for you, they will turn into your enemies. Don't have any misunderstanding about this. 
Don't have any doubt about this. It happens, isn't it so? Hmm? If you don't handle your own children properly, they will turn into your enemies. No? You have any doubt? No, not my son, he won't do that. Don't have any doubt, he'll do that. <laughs> if you don't handle him right, he will turn into your enemy. Yes or no? Yes or no? That's the way life is. Now, why is it your mind, such a powerful, beautiful, miraculous thing has turned into your enemy? This is something we have to look at, whether you have an ailment or you're on the way. <laughs> Whichever way, it's time you look at it, isn't it so? You shouldn't uh, let any time pass because thinking diseases in and thinking diseases out is not fun. It'll cost life. Once you have an ailment, it becomes a full-time engagement. You won't have any other luxury of sitting and listening to spiritual discourse like this. It'll take away everything. You'll be sitting in a hospital queue. Yes or no? It's not fun. Yes? It's not fun. Till you get there, you don't realize how bad it is. <laughs> I want you, everybody, however healthy you are, once a month, take a tour of a major hospital in your town. You must. Really. <laughs> you must go and see. Not for some perverse pleasure, but you must see what can happen to human beings. Just small things wrong, that's all. They didn't commit any great crime. They were just every day creating little acid in their stomach. See where it's gotten them. You handle everything right, still you know the damn tick may get into you <laughs> and cause problems, who knows? Yes, you handle everything right, doesn't matter. You got into an airplane, you're thinking they're all people, but the swine flu got into you. <laughs> Somebody's a swine there, you don't know. <laughs> if you do everything right, still there are million problems, isn't it so? Yes? The nature of life is such, even if you drink milk, you could get poisoned. But if you're talking about drinking poison and living well, all the best, <laughs> that's all I can say. Isn't it so? If you eat good food, it can turn into poison in your stomach, it's possible. If you eat the best things, it can turn into poison. You want to eat poison and live well? I can only wish you luck because there's no other way for such a person, isn't it? You are churning up poison and hoping to live well, Oh, you need lot of luck. <laughs> we have to ar arrange the whole tapestry of stars into a line, straight line for you. All the stars in line for you. Otherwise, it not, life will not work for you, it'll get you. So, please keep your mind in line. It should work for you. It should do beautiful things for you, not ugly things. Why is your mind doing ugly things? So, <laughs> now I can't stand how I can't stand up. If I develop resentment, resentment, anger, hatred, these are all poisons you drink and you expect someone else to die. Life doesn't work like that. If you drink the poison, only you die, not somebody else. I hate, I hate her, I want her dead, I want her dead. Only you die, not her. Isn't it? You drink poison and you expect somebody else to die. It doesn't work like that. So, uh, you need to get this straightened out. If your mind is working against you, first and foremost thing that you do is, take a break from every damn thing that you're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You understand? Your work, your family, your nonsense, take a break from everything, 
go to an appropriate place. If you want, you can come here or go to India, go somewhere else, wherever it works for you. Do something about this one. Fix this one before you enter the world, isn't it? So sit down in one place, see what you can do about this one. Because once you live in this world, either you must do something good to yourself or you must do something good to ten people around you. Either you must be keeping yourself truly joyful and living, you don't care about anybody, it doesn't matter, at least you're happy, we're okay. Or you're doing something nice for somebody around you, you're okay. Anybody who is not doing any good to himself or to anybody around him has really no right to call himself human, isn't it? That much intelligence and awareness nature has put into you, isn't it so? Yes? Maybe you can't uh, do some great act in the world, it doesn't matter. At least walk gently upon this planet, that much you can do, right? Yes? Maybe you can't go out and serve the whole world, it doesn't matter. At least walk joyfully. If you walk joyfully on this planet, suddenly you see the whole world looks beautiful. Once the whole world looks beautiful, naturally you will shed a glance, a loving glance upon everything. This is natural process, is it so? If you walk through this very joyfully, whatever you look at looks beautiful. Once everything looks beautiful to you, you naturally shed a very loving glance upon everything that you see. You are a blessed being, that's all it takes. And if you are not so, isn't it time that you take some time off and work upon yourself? No, no, I am doing something important, you are not doing anything important. Because in everything that you do, who you are will find expression, isn't it? Hmm? Not your stupid good intentions which will find expression, who you are will find expression in everything that you do. If you have poison in your head with good intentions, you'll inject poison into the world. That's what is happening in the world. More damage is happening to this world with good intentions than with bad intentions, isn't it so? In 1934, Hitler, Adolf Hitler gave a speech in Hamburg and he said, I am doing the duty of my forefathers. When people asked him why he is rounding up people and sending them to the gas. And I want you to understand, I believe that he was not lying, he believes. That's the most dangerous thing. He is not a liar, he believes what he is doing. That's what empowers the men. Within a short span of time, the way he organized the whole nation and made everybody believe whatever he believes in, is not simple organization, phenomenal organization, isn't it? Because the man believes hundred percent and he believes that he is the best thing, he is doing the best thing that can be done to the world. So, your good intentions are not going to save the world. How you are and how you are will change only if you can breathe, walk, lie down, sit down joyfully. If you cannot do this one thing, everything else will be just poison, whatever you do. Only when you are pleasant within yourself, you feel pleasant about everything around you. Only when you feel pleasant about everything around you, you move around with a certain sense and value to life around you. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much morality you carry in you, how many scriptures you remember, you will find ways to do the cruelest possible things. So the first and foremost business, the first and basic responsibility for a human being is how he sits here. Are you sitting here joyfully? Are you sitting here with some misery being manufactured in your head? This is the foremost thing that you have to attend to, only after that everything else because otherwise nothing else really works, please see. Whenever you feel very miserable, always the thought comes, you want to end your life. You don't take action on that, but thought comes, isn't it? Yes or no? You try this 
Twenty-four hours you remain in misery. You always entertain yourself with a television or a book or a friend or something. Don't do that. Twenty-four hours just remain in misery. Within twenty-four hours, you'll get serious thoughts that you want to end your life, for sure. Because nobody can bear misery more than for a few minutes. More than a few minutes, you need a diversion, otherwise you'll go crazy, isn't it? To understand misery does not work, that's not the way to conduct life, whatever may be your life situation, whatever I'm saying. Whatever may be happening with your life, maybe when you came to the satsang, you packed everything in your car and come and you have no house to go back to. <laughs> maybe if you come from Michigan <laughs> Not you, okay, not you <laughs> Maybe something else, there may be many things in life. Whatever it may be, you are better off than when you were born, isn't it? You came with nothing. At least you got something now. You are on the prophet's side. <laughs> Look at the beauty of life. You came with utterly nothing. Whatever may be happening, you are still in profit, not in loss. So you cannot complain. Hmm? <laughs> Isn't it so? <laughs> so, don't try to think your disease away. Think your misery away. Hmm? If you think your misery away, ailment or no ailment, we'll see. We fear technology because of the kind of people who will handle it. That's a problem. Technology is a fantastic facilitator. Technology is a big relief from a huge burden we've been carrying on our heads. But we fear this well-being because we have not taken care of what kind of human beings we create on this planet. We have not focused on that. We have not focused, our education systems have not focused on what sort of human beings we produce in this world. We are trying to fix it with five ethics or morals or don't do this, do this. This is not going to work. Forever they have thought and these things have not worked because you cannot restrain a human being by telling him, do this, don't do this. If there was a sense of inclusiveness, as we went through this earlier, if you sat here and experienced all of them as part of yourself, you will not need any kind of guideline from anybody. You will not do anything unnecessary for somebody else, isn't it? This is yoga. Yoga means there is a union with everything around you. Right now, we are valuing only people's memory. Well, we will produce machines which will have a million GB. All right? So your brains cannot contain that much. So now it becomes significant. We are coming to a time where human consciousness will become the most important thing. One thing the machine cannot do is to be conscious. So what kind of a human being you are will become more important what than what nonsense you carry in your head. Isn't it great time? Hello? Great times are coming <laughs> So we should not fear technology. Well, as you said, laws to regulate this, that you can do, but within no time there will be technologies to circumvent those laws, as you're seeing always. Well, all these years if you make a law, it takes fifteen, twenty years to circumvent it. The time is coming if you make a law, within three days they'll circumvent it. Yes, because uh, the capability is such. So these are great times that none of your laws will work. The only thing that will work is what sort of human being are you? Then human energy, human education, everything needs to focus on what sort of human beings do we produce. This should become the prime interest of humanity that what kind of a human being am I? Am I inclusive or exclusive? This is a basic question. Yes, you're absolutely right because right from the first invention of man, which is fire, 
it can be used for good and for bad purposes. So I think every invention of man has a dual use. You can use it for good, you can also use it for harm. And I think as you rightly pointed out, it is only your inner ethical and moral compass that guides, you know, how, what use you put to that technology. But I think we have to be very watchful to see that <coughs> the good, the benefits outweigh, you know, some of the potential harms and unless we are proactively thinking about it, it may just come upon us and it, it may be too late. Can I say something which is a little... <laughs> little ahead of time, but it's time to look at it because times will roll faster in the coming years. See, please look back and see, in this world, people who thought they're really good people, they have created more harm in this world, or so-called bad people have caused more harm in this world, please tell me. Hello? Good people cause more harm, unfortunately, because it's a good Indian fighting a good Pakistani. Uh, it is a good Muslim fighting a good somebody else. It is a good American fighting just about anybody uh, <laughs> Because the more good you think you are, you have more reason to fight, unfortunately. Bad, so-called bad people, criminals, they kill one or two. The real raising of civilizations happen by people who believe they are doing a great thing, isn't it? They are very proud, they are fulfilling their uh, mor moral uh, compass, they are fulfilling their ideologies, their philosophies. They really believe they're doing a great thing. Especially the moment you think you're not just doing good, you're doing God's own work, you will do the maximum damage. Because the nature of human action is such, our actions are never perfect. Never, ever. One who thinks they're doing perfect action is a fool. Our actions are never perfect. When our actions are not perfect, there must be little hesitation in everything that we do. But the moment you believe you are the best or the greatest or the best possible creature on this planet, then you can do horrible things with absolute confidence. Yes, if you have little doubt, you will hesitate. So this is very important. We have tried to manage humanity by the fear of God. It's not worked. We have tried to manage humanity with goodness and karma. You do this, you will be punished somewhere else. It has not worked. We have tried to manage human be beings by teaching them ethics, morals, everything, but you know in how many different ways they circumvent that when it's to their advantage. But what you know as myself, what you know as a part of yourself, with that you don't need any of these things, isn't it? If I see you as a part of myself, I don't need the fear of God not to harm you, I don't need morals not to harm you, I don't need ethics to keep myself away from harming you, I just won't do it because such a thing never arises within me. I think you brought us back to the I'm sorry the if I'm very abrasive. Yeah. No, no, no. You brought us back to the theme of inclusiveness. Inclusiveness. Yes. <laughs> I, I want to ask you next about, uh, about primary health care and preventive health because after all I come from WHO and we have to remember that we have only about 10 years left for the Sustainable Development Goals to achieve health for all, that is the SDG 3. Now, health was enshrined in the very constitution of the World Health Organization and health was defined even at that time, not just as a physical health but also mental, spiritual and social health and not just the absence of disease but of, of well-being. It was also stated that it's a fundamental right of every human being to attain the highest attainable standards of health, that governments have a responsibility of providing basic health care services to their population but also that individuals and communities need to take active responsibility and cooperate in order to uh, improve the health of the, of, of the people. 
So we see now more and more countries, the heads of states are actually committing to universal health coverage. In India, we have the Prime Minister launch the Ayushman Bharat program last year, which aims to cover 500 million people with uh, not only with health insurance, but also with primary health care services. But again, primary health care, many people think it's been interpreted in different ways. People think about it as an essential package of health services. People have interpreted it as just a selective package of health services which you provide only to the poor. And others have interpreted it through, from social and political and economic aspects. But the way we, WHO defines primary health care is of course to deliver the basic health services across the life course to address again not only um, treatment and diagnosis but preventive services, rehabilitation, palliative care, long-term care throughout the life course from the newborn to the elderly and we have to appreciate now that the proportion of elderly is growing worldwide and we will have by 2030 about 500 million people globally over the age of 80 years and the most rapid increases are going to happen in Asia, Latin America and Africa of, of elderly. How do you integrate them? How do you make sure they live good quality of life till the very end. But primary health care is also about making the right policies, public policies, like banning tobacco and, and smoking in public places, by making sure that there are uh, water and sanitation services. We're in... banning tobacco and make marijuana legal. <laughs> <laughs> That's another debate, yes. And also the third element of primary health care is to empower individuals and communities actually to take action at the local level so that they can optimize their own health. They can advocate for policies. We see young people now, Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old who, who has been advocating for climate change and who's actually managed to, to get heads of state to, to stand up and you know, take notice of what she's saying. So I think a lot of hope now on young people. But People need to be co-developers of health and social services, but also they are self-carers and caregivers to others within their own families and communities. How can we integrate the practice of yoga and, uh, and traditional medicine into our primary health care services so that they, they keep people healthy? It's not a question of treating illness once they're already ill, it's, it's a bit late. Of course, there are medicines and, and things which you can use. But the aim should be to keep people healthy as long as possible. How do we integrate this? And have you had personal experience in India of being able mm -hmm. to scale that up? Now, the last part of your question uh, is easy for me to answer. How to integrate yoga, how to make it available, large scale, various things are being done. But the larger part of your question, he will not settle with a a simple answer from me because better than anyone, you know the complexities involved in that. And uh, <clears throat> as you come up with more solutions, people will come up with more issues. Let's say now you spoke about India, Ayushman Bharat, the wonderful thing is uh, Prime Minister is taking a two parallel uh, ways. One is he's pushing yoga on one side and talking about insurance when you fall sick. Falling sick is not your privilege. Every human being needs to understand this, that it's not a privilege or your right to fall sick. You have no business to fall sick. But if it happens, it is only an emergency net. But in advanced countries, in Western countries, particularly I'm watching in United States, People think insurance is their privilege and they must exercise it. A nation with over… see, an individual person or a society or a nation seeks affluence. In the initial stages, because affluence promises choice of nourishment. In later stages, affluence brings choice of lifestyle. This is all human beings are seeking through affluence. So the most affluent country on the planet which has a, a wide choice of nourishment and lifestyle, seventy percent of them are on prescription medication. Spends over three trillion dollars as healthcare bill. 
A country which has so many choices of nourishment and lifestyle should not have a healthcare bill like that, isn't it? Hello? But seventy percent are on prescription medication, the remaining thirty percent of course buying it off the back streets. This… every nation is heading in this way as if this is the example to follow. Every… every nation is moving in that direction, that people are beginning to think, uh, my health is my government's responsibility or maybe it's a WHO's responsibility. No, every individual needs to understand my health is my business. If it goes wrong, somebody will support you, that's a different matter. But staying healthy is my business as an individual person. This… this is what yoga inculcates, that your health is one hundred percent your business. You should not misunderstand the insurance net and government uh, healthcare systems as a place that you need to go every day because it's there, it's your privilege to go there and exercise your right as a citizen. You have no business to go there as a life. As a life, you have no business to go to your hospital. You must live well and go straight to the undertaker. <laughs> yes <laughs> You are going to the hospital because you not enough attention has been paid as to how this mechanism works. The most complex, the most sophisticated machine on the planet is human mechanism. Do you agree with me? No, I'm not saying uh, how complicated you are, I'm talking about the <laughs> human mechanism. <laughs> but uh, the problem is most human beings are trying to live here without even reading the user's manual. So the initial aspect of yoga means, first thing is you read the user's manual. How does this work? What does what in this one? I was just talking to a group of American people, they said, Sadhguru, why there's so much ill health in America? I said, see, there are many aspects. Let me not uh, go into a big uh, uh, talk about what are all the things you need to fix. I said, if you just allow me to redesign your furniture in America, you will see your healthcare bill as a person will come down minimum thirty to forty percent. Just your furniture, the way you sit. Most furniture is made in such a way, if I go sit like this, <laughs> this is the only way you can sit. You cannot sit like this. If you sit like this, you're inviting illnesses because just to tell you a little bit, all of you know this, many of you are medical doctors, in this, here is all the vital organs. None of them are fixed with nuts and bolts, it's all hanging in nets. Hello? Only if you sit like this, they all function to their best. If you sit like this, they'll all pile on each other and they will not function well. It's as simple as that. Especially with a full stomach, after lunch if you sit like this, it definitely you're asking for trouble. Now, like this, there are many things we can go on with. I'm saying small things, if we just understand how this works, simple forms of yoga is just that. You just understand how your breath works, how your heart beats, how things are functioning, how you should sit, stand and breathe. If this much you understand, most probably you will never go to your doctor. But there are other influences, you're breathing chemicals, you're eating chemicals, drinking chemicals, exposed to so many things, there are infections. And above all, there is a population where hardly you find a space where there are no people. People are infection, you know. Hello? <laughs> uh, once there are a group of people, there, there are chimneys of infections going on. Our bodies have to battle to somehow manage this stuff. If only there's enough space, if there was enough space on the planet, I think they're transporting all the men to the Mars, then I think the ladies can live well here <laughs> If there was enough space on this planet, that is if the populations were little less than what it is, a whole lot of this healthcare wouldn't be necessary simply because there's simply little more distance between human beings. Well, we have not addressed that at all. United Nations uh, made a prediction by 2050, we'll be 9.7 billion people. 
Well, they are going by the predictions, by looking at the rate of growth and the extension of human life, which is a wonderful thing. But why don't we plan by 2050 or 75, we'll be 3.5 billion people? We need a plan, isn't it? We are so smart. If we think there are too many elephants in Africa, we cull them. All right? Hello? We are that smart. How come we don't understand if we extend or postpone our death, we also need to postpone our birth. How come we don't un understand simple arithmetic? We've got too much going in our head, too full of ourselves. We don't see that one of me is bad enough, I don't have to leave ten behind. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Children are wonderful, all right? But, but we produce children, we must also leave a wonderful world for them to live, isn't it? If you create a nasty and harsh world, if you create a very harsh world and go, these wonderful children that you bear will become ugly animals, believe me. It's very important that we leave a pleasant and wonderful world so that they can fulfill their lives as wonderful human beings. Is this not important? So if we want to address healthcare without addressing population issues, I think uh, we are not serious about <coughs> what we're talking. We cannot talk about human health without addressing the population issue in a big way. Most nations have just given it up because it's religiously sensitive or whatever, uh, even in India, there was a family planning ministry. Now that has been transformed into family welfare. I, uh, I appreciate the intention, but we must be able to gauge the realities of our existence, not ideologies of what we think, isn't it? In the beginning of twentieth century, we were only 1.6 billion people. Today we are 7.6 billion people in one century. Uh, this is not just because of reproduction, this is because human life, people are living more full. For example, in 1947 when India got its independence, the average life expectancy of an Indian was 28 years. Today it is 71, fantastic. We want it to become 91 if it's possible. Average life expectancy should be eighty-five, ninety. it should get there. But when we postpone death, we must also postpone birth. It is not compulsory that everybody must reproduce. This is coming because of a tribal mindset, what will I leave behind? It is because of this people want to accumulate things that they don't need. They want to grab everything, half the world they want to conquer because they got ten children. This needs to go. A time has come where human consciousness should become more important than human biology. If you're identified with your bi biology, uh, you're still having an evolutionary issue, isn't it? Hello? If your biology is the most dominant force in you, you're still having an evolutionary issue. It is time we think beyond our biology. Many of you who are here with your spouses or your partners, you didn't uh, deliver your spouse, isn't it? But you're doing quite fine with them. I'm saying you can do quite fine with people that you don't deliver. So maybe just um, the last question for this uh, uh, session could be, I think what you said made me think about uh, a couple of things. Um, Immunization, vaccines have been one of the greatest public health uh, discoveries. In fact, one of the reasons why the lifespan increased so much yes, definitely. is because of the availability of vaccines. We used to lose, you know, half the number of children who were born used to die of pneumonia, diarrhea and other infections. Today, that mortality has been brought down significantly thanks to vaccines but also to antibiotics. But now suddenly we are seeing a different trend. <laughs> if you look at the news, Every day you hear about measles outbreaks, not in some remote corner of Africa, but in France, in Germany, in Ukraine, in the United States. 
In fact, the President of the United States and most of the mayors and governors have been speaking up about the importance of immunization. Because if you take a disease like measles, it's not enough for me to vaccinate my child and hope that it will be protected. You need what is called herd immunity. And to get herd immunity, you need about 90-95% of the children in that community to be vaccinated. So, an individual action, a parent decides my child does not need a vaccine because of whatever belief. It's sometimes religious, but very often it's not religious. And a recent survey just came out a few days ago showed that people believed in the safety of vaccines 95% and above in Asia and Africa, but only 70% in Western Europe and even less in Eastern Europe. Only 50% of pe people, adults, believe that vaccines are safe. So there's, this is beyond logic, it's beyond science, it's beyond uh, any factual information that we give to people. It doesn't seem to be working. And, and yet, it impacts many others. You don't vaccinate your child, but the child who gets measles and dies may be somebody else's child. And so I think it comes back to what you were saying about it's not just yourself. You need to think about, you need to think about the humanity, community, society, and most importantly, the planet where we live and how we can modulate those actions. This is a phenomena that uh, we must observe historically or within families or individuals. Human beings get tired of well-being, they want some trouble. <laughs> they like trouble, you know? They like it really. See, America spent uh, billions and billions of dollars to build highways, but now everybody buys off-road vehicles because people like some trouble. Too much order, creates a certain level of uh, irritation in the human being. He wants little chaos. They must visit India <laughs> uh, So, this campaign is gaining momentum in... Uh, particularly in California, big time. A whole lot of parents coming to me and asking this, I'm telling them, don't be a fool. Because uh, when you find your child is either crippled with polio or something else, I remember this very well, when I was in school, there were four children in my school. Uh, I never stayed in one school for too long. So I was there maximum two years, three years, in any given school, three was the maximum. So, uh, in that high school where there was... I was in one school for three years, in high school there were four polio-affected uh, boys, three of them boys, one girl, who came to school in... Uh, uh, what... Uh, in a wheelchair. But many places the wheelchair wouldn't go in those days, so they would drag themselves and go. It was so terrible to see them, but today, even if you go to the remotest village in India, even if you go to the government schools where we work, there's not a single polio-affected child, it's fantastic to see that. So we don't know the value of these things. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we get tired of well-being, we want to invite some trouble. But having said that, I was talking to some of the parents in California, they were saying, they're being put through some forty or forty-two different types of vaccines. They're saying it is causing learning disability, this, that, for all kinds of things. Maybe in United States, and I don't know what's the situation in Europe, maybe they're overdoing it a little bit. A apart from treating the basic things which were affecting children, which would cause death or uh, cripple, you know, it would cripple a child, I think they're attending to trying to give vaccine for just about everything. This may be affecting. I'm, uh, I'm not uh, some kind of a medical expert or something to make a commentary on this, but from listening to the parents, this is what I gathered. I don't remember all the things that they said they're giving vaccines for. I thought some of them were just absurd. Some of those illnesses a child can go through, it's okay, he catches a flu, he, something happens. It's all right to go through those things when you're growing up, but they're giving vaccines for a whole lot of things which is... which may not be necessary, which today parents are apprehensive, maybe causing learning disability or some other problem. It may not be connected, I don't know, but this is the fear that is being spread. 
But the power and the well-being that vaccines have brought to our lives, most of us are sitting here because we were vaccinated. Hello? Yes? Otherwise we wouldn't be here. Definitely we wouldn't be here, many of us. So, uh, we should not... Uh, see, the problem is just this, especially now because social media and things, we either go this extreme or that extreme. I feel uh, being the World Health Organization, uh, please look into this, I'm not an expert, but what kind of vaccines they're giving in... the spectrum of vac vaccines they're giving in United States, for example. If it is too much, I think WHO should tell them this much is not needed. This is compulsory, rest is by choice. If it's made like that, uh, I think uh, there'll be a more healthy proportion. Otherwise, some parents are just not vaccinating their children. I said, you must be crazy, you lose your child. Anytime it can happen, the child goes to school and that may be the end of it. Uh, but uh, out of their, uh, you know, their fear that vaccine is going to damage their brains or something, they are going for this kind of decision-making. I think a clear statement from an organization like WHO would help parents to make a better choice. Thank you, Sadhguru. And um, I just wanted to clarify that um, um, vaccines cause adults, that's what you said. None of us would be sitting here if it were not for vaccination. So let's think of vaccines as causing adults. And I don't think there's anything as too much of a good thing. So the problem has been the anti-vax campaign. Skeptics who have spread many, many... There are side effects of everything. Everything has a side effect, but one in a million, maybe one in two million. But they have been blown out of proportion. And this gets circulated through social media. So social media can have both very good uh, benefits, but also can propagate falsehoods very rapidly. And I think one needs to be always a little skeptical of things that we see on social media and, and check for ourselves the veracity. As far as WHO is concerned, we have absolutely very clear-cut guidelines on, on vaccination. And um, there is, as I said, very clear guidance both for the public and for practitioners on which vaccines are absolutely essential for all children. But I think it needs to be more published. Perhaps it has to be or more... Or if you give such knowledge to us, we will That will be wonderful. Publish. Because uh, when I spoke to the parents, their concerns were genuine. They are not... They are not those flaky new agey mm. types. They are genuinely well concerned that this may affect their children. You're right. I think the messaging probably needs yes. to be done through people whom they believe. And uh, some people believe the doctors, but may, maybe they also like to hear it from, from others. So... And if there's credible scientific credible, information... yes. And also clearly what is a must and what is choice. What is uh, If that is created, I think it'll be good. Thank you very much Thank for you. this opportunity. Thank you Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for the truly insightful and absorbing conversation. The next segment of the program is a question and answer session. It's my pleasure to invite on stage Mr. Francis Gurry to moderate this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. She was a doctor. It's okay. You're a lawyer. Don't ask difficult questions. <laughs> Sadhguru, it's really a privilege to have this opportunity to uh, interact with you and please allow me to thank Ambassador Rajiv Chanda for giving me this opportunity. I think actually it's a sign of the greatest inclusiveness that India should invite an Australian uh, on International Yoga Day during the middle of the World Cricket Cup. <laughs> <laughs> So this no, doesn't mean we are being to go, this doesn't mean we are going to be kind to you on the cricket field. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed. 
It is, sir. So now I have many questions from many people in the audience who would like to ask for your wisdom. But may I start by asking you one myself? Yes. So uh, the power of inclusiveness. Now, if we go back in the world, say, 30 years, we... Continue your journey of self-discovery and consciousness expansion with us. Share this video to inspire others to join us on this journey of personal growth.